Good <clears throat> morning, everybody from sunny Florida. It's good to see you guys again. Glad, glad to see so many people joined again. I'm kind of surprised. Um, we've got two lectures today. Um, they're a bit shorter, less um, fewer slides, so we should be able to get through them in sufficient amount of time for if there's questions. Um, for those watching, maybe live on YouTube, um, if you have any questions during the lecture, go ahead and email Marcus, and he'll post it on the on the Google Plus chat room, and I'll I'll be able to respond to it um, in real time as I as I see those come up. Otherwise, <clears throat> be feel free to email Marcus, and he can email me or forward it to me, and I can respond after the fact. So either way, if you have any questions, we'll be able to to get that sorted out hopefully. Um, Marcus probably sent you a bunch of PDFs that I posted to the Dropbox site. Those are some great primary literature on concepts of overfishing and fishing down food webs and food chains, <coughs> um, some fisheries concepts in terms of uh, climate, future climate impacts. Um, those are great references. If you have any questions, um, we're not going to cover those during these lectures, but if you have any questions after you read through that material, um, I'd be happy to set up a Google Plus Hangout. There's multiple people that are interested in having like a discussion group session. Um, we can we can sort that out at uh, at a future date. Or you can, if it's just one or two people that have one or two questions regarding data analysis or terminology, um, feel free to email me um, or Marcus, and he'll forward it to me, and I can respond um, after the fact. Um, Anyway, without further ado, let me start sharing my window and we can get started on our first lecture today. Okay, hopefully everybody is seeing um, the part three. Uh, Marcus, you want to give me a you want to give me a uh, thumbs up and I'll. Yes, okay, everybody sees. All right, so this is a uh, set of lectures that's a adapted and kind of modified from a course uh, out of the University of Rhode Island by uh, Dr. Uh, Dalteris and uh, uh, Dr. Scrobe. They have a series of lectures on fishery science, um, some very kind of complicated math that we're not going to get into regarding selectivity. Um, hello, Uta. No, 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 no. Um, so, uh, if you're more interested in kind of a deeper dive, I can provide those lectures as well. They're not, um, they're a little bit beyond the purview of this set of lectures. Anyway, moving on. Um, presentation is kind of basic. We're going to go through the historical background of fishery science, fisheries management, uh, what is a basic stock assessment, what's involved in that, um, different types of data that are used to go into stock assessment models, including uh, independent and dependent data different gear types um, and, you know, some uh, concepts of research surveys and various aspects of uh, kind of biological parameters of different models and how uh, the, the different components of different models um, over the years. Um, first of all, what the stock assessment basically is using math and science to kind of assess uh, not only the uh, number of individuals perhaps in a particular species stock, but also biomass and uh, how that uh, that species or actual stock and abundance is affected by what we just talked about last week, including those abiotic factors, those environmental physical parameters, as well as um, more as more as we become more advanced in understanding marine food webs, uh, what are those biotic factors, those ecological interactions? Um, you know, getting to more towards an ecosystem-based fisheries concept in terms of stock assessment. So that's what we're pushing towards. Uh, now, stock assessment is a subset kind of of what fishery science is. Fishery science are the, the nerdy guys, not actually like me, I'm a marine ecologist, but uh, those scientists that study specific fisheries or specific species and fisheries and what, uh, in particular, the different biotic and uh, abiotic factors and how those actually impact that species. Um, it also, in many instances, will study how the human components of different fisheries in terms of gear types or selectivity um, or bycatch can impact a particular species or suite of species that are being harvested by uh, man-made commercial fisheries or recreational fisheries. Now, fishery engineering and technology, of course, uh, is a set of 
you know, engineering scientists that are basically trying to develop better methods for either improving catch per unit effort, so in increasing the amount of catch for any uh, particular fishing um, instance, um, constructing new devices or new methodologies and protocols. Uh, you know, there's been some advances in avoiding bycatch or discard in trawl designs. We'll, we'll look at that some a little bit later in the lecture. Um, so that's engineering, kind of looking at how to better catch fish and hopefully more sustainably is a new trend within fishery engineering and technology. And then lastly, there's fishery management, which is uh, essentially what you guys are going to be working on, is kind of developing those policies that are going to be geared towards increasing uh, sustainable harvest of the various kind of demersal fisheries that you guys are going to be working on in the EU. So these are the sets of regulations or methodologies or banning of methodologies to uh, improve a uh, more sustainable ecosystem over there in the EU. So, um, but that has a lot to do with what are these kind of predetermined objectives in terms of how you're harvesting fish stocks. Uh, for a long, long time, um, maximum sustainable yield has been the goal. But I think, uh, hopefully Katie agrees with me, and hopefully I'm on the right page with everybody on the Pew team that we're trying to move towards a more sustainable ecosystem-based approach that accounts uh, where maximum sustainable yield is not necessarily what we're trying to drive for in terms of fisheries management, more of an optimum sustainable yield, which takes into account those biotic interactions of how an ecosystem actually functions. Uh, so some of you might be interested in some of the history of how stock assessments began. Um, uh, basically, before the 1800s, it was all thought of act of gods or even the Greek days that, you know, wicked people were being punished by um, Zeus and Neptune, uh, and that's, you know, the whimsy of how fish themselves were being caught. So, But uh, shortly after, uh, <coughs> during the 19th century, um, variations in catches began to receive more and more scientific attention. Uh, through the establishment of various marine laboratories in the U.S. Uh, Woods Hole is one in the U.S. Uh, various ones in England, uh, Norway, Italy, Russia, and France all became much more interested in um, the science of fishing, as it were, at that, at that point in time, and how, how you can more <coughs> maximize your catch per effort unit. Uh, it finally kind of came to a head, I guess, in London in uh, the fishing exhibition in 1883. Um, there were two schools of thought. Uh, Dr. Lancaster had an idea that man's impact on fish stock, man could have an impact on fish stocks and actually reduce numbers of fishes. Uh, but the famous scientist Thomas Huxley, who seems to have had a comment or input on virtually every realm of science, um, was of the mindset that basically um, the ocean was so vast that man couldn't possibly have an impact on stock abundance of various fisheries. Um, so basically very, the ocean was immune to man, mankind's uh, impact. Um, <clears throat> that debate continued into the late 19th century. Um, there was an interesting fishery board out of, stock, uh, out of Scotland that performed some trawling experiments over a decade. Uh, one researcher, uh, Fulton, in 1896 produced a paper that showed there was conclusive impacts of trawling that did affect uh, fish abundance. He showed uh, reduced catches over time uh, associated with that uh, set of trawling experiments out of Scotland. Uh, and then finally, around the turn of the century into the 20th century, uh, ICES was formed, which is the very first international marine biological body that was associated with uh, fishery science and fisheries stock assessments. And this, is, these are, this is the group that you guys I believe we'll be uh, taking a uh, more uh, a deep, uh, course, which is a deeper dive into uh, specific models in fishery science, uh, I think in May or March. Um, okay, just checking my chat rooms for two slides. Um, <clears throat> so uh, ICES is basically the first body that looked at um, fisheries in the North Atlantic. It had an overfishing committee that looked at uh, commercial catch data as well as independent surveys using their own vessel to estimate um, different species abundances and biomasses. There was also a migration committee that looked at the effect of migrating populations of fishes. Um, in the early 1900s, ICES released some of their first stock assessments that are on very 
uh, species that you'll be working on with the mixed uh, demersal trawl fisheries, including place, cod, and herring in the North Sea, which we will uh, be talking about in the second lecture in terms of specific life history characteristics and fish, fishing methods and um, evolutionary histories to those species. Uh, then shortly after uh, that, World War I came around in 1915 and 1918, I believe. Um, and this was uh, an unintentional uh, man-made experiment where basically fishing stopped in the North Sea because of the outbreak of war, uh, which allowed uh, significant stock rebuilding in many fisheries so that after the war they saw replenished abundances of uh, those very, uh, very same species in the North Sea place, cod and herring. Um, so it was the first kind of inadvertent uh, kind of region-wide experiment that showed that man was having an impact on fish abundances and stocks um, with, associated with kind of the uh, First World War. Uh, then earlier, <laughs> around 1930, Dr. Russell came up with one of the first general models of how fish populations actually respond to harvesting. And so the equation S2 equals S1 plus <coughs> recruitment, which is essentially A and G minus mortality and a catch. So S2 is the harvest population after fishing, uh, with the presumed S1 being the size or biomass of the harvestable population before fishing. Um, a is what uh, is an antiquated term that actually looked at the mass of fish entering the fishery. So you can think of this as another, um, as an analog to recruitment potential. Um, G, of course, would be a species-specific uh, growth rate in terms of overall biomass increase of the population. Um, M is mortality uh, due to natural mortality, so this is not necessarily associated with fishing harvest, but actual predator-prey interactions. And then C is mortality level, which we now call F, which is associated with actual catching or harvest. So F, M is natural mortality, C is the catch mortality, which is now termed F in modern models. Um, <clears throat> models became uh, increasingly more complex, looking at age structures of species in terms of uh, cohorts, so first year cohorts, second year cohorts. Um, you also had uh, models developing spawning stock biomass and recruitment relationships determining how many, how much um, uh, biomass was actually producing uh, new recruits to the fishery uh, and things like surplus miles, which we'll talk a little bit more about in, towards the end of the lecture. And then again, we had another great inadvertent man-made uh, fishing experiment, at least that encompassed a much larger region of the North Atlantic, um, which was World War II. So we had about six years where the North Atlantic was, and much of the South Atlantic was devoid of fishing activity because of German U-boats and uh, the dangers of uh, fishing and large commercial uh, enterprises uh, during the war. So we had a second great fishing experiment associated with World War II, and again we saw a rebounding of stocks, especially in the North Sea and North Atlantic. <coughs> okay, um, now Cushing in 68, and here's the actual text if you want to track down that uh, textbook, Fisheries Biology, a Study of Population Dynamics. This is a classic within fisheries science literature. Um, a fit, an ideal stock is one that has a single spawning ground to which adults return year after year, and it is contained within one or more current systems used by that stock to maintain geographic integrity. So this is a, a stock that ends up in the same place every year spawning, and you know where and when to go catch it. That would be his I definition of an ideal stock. Um, now, if you guys really want to get into some of the more fascinating history of how fishing has actually impacted civilization and societies over very long time scales. I highly recommend um, this book, Cod, by Mark Kurlansky. Um, it's a fascinating, detailed um, biography of how cod, which we're going to talk about a lot in the second lecture, um, has, has been uh, indelibly interwoven with uh, kind of the, the evolution of civilization in Europe and in America. Um, all the way from Viking times in the Basque to uh, modern uh, warfare times off of Iceland and, and Britain and, and the Newfoundland coast of America. So um, it's a really fascinating um, look at how a single species 
um, had a lot to do with various kind of enterprises and development of uh, not only Western civilization, um, but uh, the, the Americas as well. So um, I highly recommend if you have a chance at that. Yeah, you're right, Mark. It is an excellent book. Uh, I have yet to read his book, Salt, which is, a, I think, a companion book to this because the uh, harvesting of salt was actually a very important aspect of being able to salt the cod so that it could be marketable and transported along distances. Um, <clears throat> yeah, if you want to, maybe want, uh, Mike's uh, actually uh, pointing out that he has an excellent children's book on overfishing as well. If you want to actually maybe send that around to the group, that would be great. Okay, so what is a fish stock? It's basically a group of fish of a single species that are managed as a single unit um, that are vulnerable to a particular fishy, fishery in a particular area, or it, the stock can be defined not only uh, uh, in terms of uh, specific harvest in specific regions, but um, populations um, associated with either genetic markers, behavior, how a particular species might migrate around, different areas, um, its locations, as I said, in terms of either the Norwegian trawl fishery versus the um, Ireland trawl fishery. Um, so, for example, the examples we have in the United States, we have a New England ground fishing uh, demersal fleet that fishes a kind of mi multi-species mixed fishery. Um, and that, you know, that's one way to find a unit of, uh, of fish stock is what's being caught in that multi-species demersal trawl. Um, then we have an interesting species known as the Atlantic striped bass, and a lot of that is managed because it is a highly migratory species that uh, goes up and down the east coast of the United States, uh, and it goes up into freshwater river systems to spawn. Um, so there's op opportunities to regulate um, the freshwater um, reproductive stage as well as the uh, marine stage where it's actually migrating and feeding. So behavior can be an important way of uh, identifying a stock. And different stocks of the Atlantic type brass, striped bass will go to different freshwater tributaries, much like salmon um, can be managed that way in different drainages. Uh, and then, of course, there are kind of uh, circumglobal species like Atlantic bluefin tuna that can be managed as a giant single species, even though there may be subdivisions in terms of population variation that's now become, coming to light between Western and Atlantic populations of bluefin tuna. And then, of course, there are certain regions which may be within international waters, like the Georgia's Bank cod fishery, where uh, certain seasons and a specific location of that shoal um, lends itself to a very rich fishery or formerly rich fishery for cod, uh, for example. <clears throat> now, stocks can be identified for management purposes uh, by the distribution of fishing effort, uh, identification of spawning grounds for fishes, and this is becoming a more um, important area, I think, in terms of not only Pew's conservation efforts, but it's being recognized scientifically more and more, especially in reef fish populations, um, that we're, we're able to predict in some ways using the geomorphology of various reefs and hydrodynamics of currents, we can um, predict where MPAs might be most appropriate. So protecting spawning aggregations it seems to be a very fruitful field for improving um, conservation of many of our marine species. Um, <clears throat> you can look at morphological and physiological characteristics. So certain species may um, spawn over different habitat types. Um, we'll see an example in um, the second uh, lecture where um, many stocks of, um, of uh, cupid herring spawn over gravelly habitats because they like their eggs to to stick on uh, the rocks, uh, but there is another um, population in the Baltic Sea that actually uses seaweeds instead of gravel, so uh, you can have morphological, physiological variation uh, between stocks that can lead to different management units. And then finally, the more uh, recent uh, advances in science are looking at uh, tagging and electrophoresis for identifying specific stock structures. This is very popular in uh, use in terms of highly migratory species, identifying their migratory routes uh, and spawning grounds. Bluefin tuna comes to mind. Shark populations come to mind where we're seeing subdivisions and uh, along the, uh, the Eastern Pacific uh, corridor where there's a number of shark fisheries. Um, so we can 
either identify that there are true subdivisions in the population or they are a kind of a ubiquitous panmictic population that is migrating up and down the coastline. So those scientific advances are becoming more and more important in terms of identifying manageable units. And the, the real difficulty it gets uh, when these types of highly migratory species are traversing uh, international or national boundaries to get international cooperation, as you guys well know, being in Europe. Finally, there are basically five types of stock assessments. Exploratory is usually um, of a kind of a scientific uh, advent where you go out and try to assess stock biomasses in abundance in a virgin fishery that hasn't had long historical commercial catches, um, identifying kind of basic biological parameters. So it's very kind of exploratory, investigatory, um, usually run by different um, science. Uh, organizations or laboratories, uh, sometimes by commercial efforts looking for uh, new um, new fisheries to exploit. Uh, then there's the index, which uh, uses uh, estimate of stock size from research vessel surveys. So this is a, a version of independent data where um, the research vessels and scientists estimate stock biomass and abundances from uh, physical capture of fishes, looking at catch per unit effort per, per tow. Um, a very accurate form of assessing stock biomass. Uh, the, the limitation of an index is that there are only so many research vessels out there, um, and it can only do so many tows compared to the commercial fleets, which have um, you know, dozens, if not hundreds, of vessels in some instances uh, sampling. So uh, sample size tends to ha be a factor in indexing because it's run by uh, research organizations that are have limited resources in terms of being able to estimate um, abundances and biomass. Uh, surplus uh, production, <laughs> of course, is um, using models that try to estimate stock biomass with uh, the amount of catch effort um, being used on that particular fishery. Uh, this is often the standard associated with um, commercial fisheries uh, that uh, are supplying fishery dependent data to um, the managers and fishery scientists that are estimating the stocks, or assessing the stocks, rather. And then finally, there are more complicated, uh, another level of uh, model, the yield per recruit. And this is kind of where we are generally at single species stock assessments through uh, the United States and, and Europe. And <laughs> this gets the concept of the, uh, estimating the spawning stock biomass per recruit. So, it uh, not only takes uh, into account fishing mortality from catch per unit effort, but it also tries to identify the cohorts of um, fishes entering into the fishery. So for each species, they'll determine age and size structures and growth rates and determine um, life history parameters, how, you know, uh, what is the um, amount, the fecundity of that particular species, what is the entry of new larval uh, recruits into the population and how long does it uh, take them to achieve sexual maturity and at what point um, are they um, part of the fishable stock biomass. Um, so this is where we are in a lot of the single model uh, fisheries around the world. And then of course there are AIDS blank structure models um, <coughs> which are, are similar to yield per recruit but it's looking at the composition of the catch of the stock. So looking at what size cohorts or year cohorts you have within the population. Um, uh, this is where you get into the concept of year classes and how fishery mortality is affecting that kind of absolute stock size within year classes over time as an age length structure type of model. Okay, finally moving on to fishing gears. Of course, you guys are gonna become very familiar with trawling, bottom trawling. Um, this is a nice slide that kind of shows the different aspects here. You have the trawler, puts the net out behind the boat. <clears throat> here you have these two doors, often called otter doors or bottom doors. Um, uh, you can have, uh, and then you have a set of floats and a bottom. This is usually a weighted line at the bottom, so it's dragging across the bottom, much like a kind of like a lawnmower, and a set of floats that open up the uh, bag of the net to uh, open a large surface area, and as the boat trawls along, the fish gets swept up into the net, and then this area is called the cod net, and this is where the fish are collected. Um, 
and this kind of depicts uh, habitat destruction associated with bottom trawls. Uh, now there are all the other types of trawls. There are demersal trawls and kind of midwater trawls where these doors are modified so that they uh, actually have a plane and the net will actually sweep through the water column and not actually have uh, uh, contact the substrate. And depending on the types of fishery, uh, fish you are or the species you are going after, some fish, some fish like um, herrings and stuff are midwater fishes and so you're going to use a midwater trawl to scoop them up. But then a lot of the fish that you guys are going to be working in terms of uh, mixed demersal multi-species conflicts over the EU are going to be a lot of uh, bottom or demersal associated fish. So they're going to be living near the bottom and so bottom trawls will be a predominant uh, component of your fisheries. Um, so these are very active fisheries. There's often with uh, trawling you have a lot of bycatch. Um, sometimes they can be size selective uh, depending on the mesh size of the actual net but they're not very species selective so anything that's within this area is going to get scooped up including the structure of the bottom, gorgonians, corals, uh, sponges, anything that can be basically mowed over is going to end up in that net and you can kind of see that from the first slide of the, the intro slide of the pages let me see if I can go back here. You can see that this is, you know, this is an example of what can be sucked up in a in a bottom trawl. Everything from echinoderms starfish to prawns to here we have a small hake and even you know bomb stingrays and flatfish. There's a sea robin here, various swimming fish or swimmer crabs. So it's very indiscriminate. Now <coughs> Uh, some interesting developments uh, have been uh, in designing new trawls uh, to reduce discards and bycatch. So some places have uh, opened up these uh, escape ranks, so a section of the net just before the cod end where there's holes, large holes that are, it's almost like a tube, a rigid tube that allows um, the escape of small undersized species of fish. Um, there's certain hydrodynamics that have been involved that kind of let these things escape out. Um, if you look at uh, this uh, kind of modified um, haddock and whiting trawl, so here's the trawl doors. These doors are modified to make the <coughs> to keep the um, net just slightly off the bottom. Cod are more associated on the, uh, with the, the bottom area. Haddock and whiting species, it's particularly hake. Um, during their feeding times, which we'll learn about in the next lecture, actually rise off the bottom a few meters and a few to several meters off the bottom. So they're almost like a demersal midwater fish. Um, so you can add a little bit of species specificity in your trawl designing your, your net as such to where it, it's capturing just above the, the, um, the substrate. And here we have a set of large meshes at the bottom of the net that allows cod to escape through but those midwater um, species like haddock and whiting, which are uh, prone to be higher in the higher in the water column, um, will uh, be caught in this smaller nest and captured in the cod net. And then, of course, you can add these kind of escape rings to let juvenile uh, fishes escape out that are undersized and not appropriate for capturing. So there are efforts in some trawl fisheries to kind of uh, reduce discard and bycatch opportunities and become more species selective in terms of what they're catching. Any questions so far? Yes, uh, you can. I mean, there are, you know, some some of the commercial fleets, This you can have this net cover uh, a couple of kilometers in uh, width where you have two giant demersal boats that are pulling the, the, a single net. Um, and you can have a single vessel net as well. So there is a lot of variation in the, in the total area that this net is covering as it's being pulled through. So this, this aspect that I'm, I'm circling here um, can be anywhere from, uh, you know, a, a small otter trawl used by research vessels that I've done down in Florida, which would be maybe four meters across, if anything, to uh, over uh, one or two kilometers in some instances. Um, and then there are other types of fishing gears which are more focused on shellfishes and in faunal. 
species like scallops and crabs and clams that burrow into the substrate. These are known as dredges. Um, these are not very species selective either. You end up getting a lot of um, invertebrate um, uh, bycatch and discard. This will end up breaking up any um, aquatic vegetation or seagrasses. So it can be quite destructive in that sense because a lot of these scallops and clams will actually live in um, in vegetated areas, so you it's a, it can be quite destructive. Uh, certain fisheries, though, however, like the sea scallops off the east coast, where it's actually a very monotypic type of substrate, which is rubble and sand. Um, scallops are these filter feeding organisms. They'll burn the sand. It actually is a very sustainable fishery. There's not a lot of habitat impact because it's a not it's not a very complex habitat. Then we have fishing pots and tra or traps, as they were. Um, these are, uh, you know, fixed and passive. They're not moving around or being pulled by any vessel. They're set out there and left out there for uh, several days to a couple weeks or overnight, um, depending on how um, productive the fishery is. Um, you get minimal bycatch. Bycatch. It can be very species specific and targeted. Um, there's usually minimal impact. Occasionally you have problems in certain areas where if the floats break loose you have what is called a ghost trap or it's a ghost fishing trap and that it keeps collecting fish um, just because it's, you know, it's a piece of structure um, and it keeps them from escaping so it can keep basically and then they'll eventually die from uh, the constraint to the trap. So um, if it breaks loose and it's not collected again it can ghost fish for um, until it uh, physically breaks down. So. That can be an issue and sometimes. They're often used for small fin fishes or reef fishes is very popular in the Caribbean, um, but also lop, uh, standard lobster and crab traps. This is that, this is the pots, which can be very large in diameter that you see. I don't know if any of you guys have been exposed to um, Dangerous Catch, which is one of our popular TV, TV shows here in the United States that does the Alaskan um, uh, king crab fishery. So they can be actually quite large, several. Uh, several meters in diameter. And then you have, of course, seines and purse seines, which are used for like tuna fisheries or smaller seines. These are usually boats that have sometimes spotter planes associated with them that are going out looking for these large schools of fishes, particularly uh, tunas or uh, menhaden. Um, a spotter plane will locate the school, radio to the boat, they steam over to the location where the school is, and they have this very large purse seine where they have a, a runner boat, which is a fast, small outboard associated with a larger vessel that um, at very high speeds encircles the school as quickly as possible. Um, and then, uh, like a purse, pulls the spring and, and closes the net in around the fishery. And these have been used for uh, several centuries, actually. Uh, particularly, there's uh, in the Mediterranean. Then, of course, we have gill nets, which are an enmeshing type of gear. These tangle the fish. Often, gill nets are made, um, not made of, um, I'm sorry, they are made of um, monofilament. So they're actually usually invisible to the fish. They don't actually see them as they approach them. This is the deceptiveness of a gill net. It's basically invisible in the water column. So the fish doesn't feel it until it runs into it. And by that time, the head has passed through the mesh. And it actually, once it tries to back out, it gets caught by its gill. So it's an entangling type of net. Um, and then once it starts thrashing, its fins get wrapped around uh, in the mesh as well. So um, the secret to a good gill net is the mesh size um, and that it's made of monofilament, so it's virtually invisible to the fish. And it has a weighted line that strings it across the bottom and some floats that bring it up at certain uh, height in the water column. Um, it has minimal habitat impact, and it's not very destructive to the substrate. Um, uh, it can be size selective, depending on the size of the mesh. It'll determine what size fish can pass through it. Uh, but it is not um, very species selective. Anything that runs into that has a, a likelihood of getting entangled if it's within the right kind of size ratio of the mesh. And then finally, we have long lines, which can be fixed or drifting, um, mobile. So uh, fishery I used to work on in, uh, uh, in the Western Atlantic was the tuna and, uh, tuna and swordfish long line fishery. 
we would set out 30 miles of line. They're baited with uh, upwards of um, you know, a couple thousand hooks um, baited with uh, mackerel or squid trying to catch swordfish and tunas and we would left it drift with the currents and fish it and it would soak. The soak time would be generally around six to eight hours. Um, these are a little more selective, size select particularly because you're using large hooks and large baits so you're going after large apex top level predator fish like sharks and tunas and swordfish and those types of things. Um, it can have minimal impact. You do have often um, uh, uh, bycatch associated with sea turtles, particularly leatherback sea turtles and loggerhead sea turtles. Um, occasionally, um, porpoises and dolphins will get foul hooked when they're they're very clever. They can actually try and remove the bait, but sometimes in rough seas they can get snagged by some of the hook sets. So occasionally you'll have um, marine mammal um, bycatch um, in this fishery as well. Uh, Yes, and you're absolutely right, Saban. They can uh, seabirds are often very much attracted to these large baits that are being because the way the long line is set is you, you you the line is being stretched out as the boat steams. The mate is on the back deck and he's putting the hook through a big mackerel or a squid and then he throws it in the air as high as he can and away from what is known as the main line. The main line is this area here. That's the main line. Then you have these what are called gangens with uh, another piece of monofilla clipped onto the main line and it is off some distance from the, uh, from the main line with the hook and the bait. In a, uh, in a drift gill net, a long line fishery, you're throwing, you know, these gangens here can be uh, 100 to 200 feet long. Um, you're trying to get down in the water column and you're fishing at night. That's when most of the fish will go through that diagonal vertical migration, particularly swordfish and Tunas will come up into the surface waters at night and during the crepuscular times, you know, to feed on these baits. And so you have these uh, baits will be down anywhere from 50 feet to 200 feet. And so the, the mate will literally throw these baits as high as it can away from the boat. But this, of course, tracks, attracts seabirds. And so the seabirds, as soon as the bait hits the water, tries to go down and scoop up the bait. And often they'll get hooked and, and you get a lot of seabird bycatch that way. That answer your question? Yeah. <clears throat> um, okay, so moving on, there are basically two types of um, commercial fishery data that are used in stock assessments and fishery science. Um, the first group is the fishery dependent data. Uh, so these are data that come from the, the commercial fishery themselves. These are landing records, these are um, number of licenses per particular fishery how many pots are being put out um, by a particular vessel, how large the trawl is, how many days are being fished, um, how long are the set times in terms of how long the trawls go on for or how long the, uh, the number of hooks that are being set by a long line. Um, all these types of things that are reported by the commercial fisheries are used to develop these fishery dependent data that go into these stock assessment models. Um, uh, the discards associated with those fisheries, um, catch per unit effort, as, as, as I just mentioned, is you know, how many days are spent on the water, how long are the trawls, how long are the long line sets. Those types of things are put under that kind of catch per unit effort. Um, what is the total uh, mortality that is associated with how much of uh, that particular species is being sold at market? And then, of course, there are subsamples that are associated with certain regulatory regimes where biological samples are taken from uh, commercial fishing efforts um, to determine either uh, reproductive biomass and stocks, uh, age structures, or even population structures within certain areas. Now, <laughs> the bugaboo with fishery dependent data is it's only as good as um, is the, the commercial fishing entities that are providing it. So this is where you get into, you know, um, the you know, how accurate are they reporting their, their catches and their efforts. Um, and this is what you're going up against in terms of, you know, these um, commercial enterprises. Uh, a lot of times they claim, you know, these are business secrets, but of course you need very accurate data in order for these fishery dependent data to have any real um, uh, veracity in uh, providing appropriate and accurate 
stock assessment uh, model. So everybody keep your mind out uh, when we're talking about fishery dependent data that it's who you got to keep in mind who's providing it and how truthful are they being in reporting. And then you have fishery independent data. And this is the data that's collected by the fishery scientists that are going out with very limited resources on the research vessels and collecting biological samples. They're uh, monitoring habitat, um, surveying the habitat, surveying community structures, like what are the species in them. You know, they're defining marine food webs. They're identifying food chains um, using, you know, isotope data to determine um, who eats what, and so, you know, as well as like looking at uh, planktonic early life history data. Um, what are the, what is the larval recruitment of some fisheries so they can go out and do plankton toes and see if there is an expected uh, future increase in recruitment because from a set of plankton toes they've done dur during a specific time of the year during a spawning aggregation of, of a particular species, they might see that there are a lot of larvae of a particular metamorphic stage, which suggests that, you know, there's going to be a good recruitment year for that species. And so these are very, you know, this is fishery independent data developed by scientists that are trying to uh, identify the specific biological and, abi and abiotic parameters that will impact um, not just a single species, but a, potentially a suite of species in terms of as we go more towards ecosystem-based management regimes. Um, and so this data is, is generally more accurate um, and it is more complete. Um, and it gives you a better sense of the holistic picture of how that marine ecosystem is functioning and how those species are interacting, interacting uh, what the true spawning stock biomass is. The limitation is that it's uh, very uh, dependent on um, sampling effort. So, you know, there aren't that many um, monitoring, there isn't a lot of monitoring capacity for a lot of um, is these kind of independent fishery data because there's just few resources for re fewer resources for re research compared to the actual commercial efforts that are going out there trying to catch fish and sell them. Any questions so far? <coughs> um, moving on, so here's a very simplistic graph that kind of, you know, in a nutshell, provides the effects of fishing on a population stock. And on the y-axis, so you can see as catch increases, uh, the number there are, or the amount of fishing involved um, increases. So at the beginning of a fishery, you can see catch comp is just going up and up and up until you reach a point in terms of the catch per unit effort where you start to affect the actual standing biomass of that stock as well as kind of the recruitment biomass of that stock in terms of the number of adults that are being able to replenish that stock to its uh, its virgin biomass levels. And then at some point, uh, in terms of amount of fishing effort, you'll see a, a eventual decline uh, due to overfishing of that species. Very simplistic. Now, there are basically two kind of general concepts that define overfishing of a stock. There's growth overfishing. And this is where the, uh, the fishery uh, is non-selective and it's catching not only adult fish, but uh, juvenile fishes, uh, taking them out of the population uh, at such a rate that these fish are not able to grow up and provide and spawn and replenish through recruitment the subsequent generations. Um, growth overfishing can be controlled through gear selectivity in trawls, so those meshes that allow the juveniles to escape as well as effort control, trying to um, avoid nursery areas where uh, yeah, avoiding, you know, ha you know, habitat refuges and nursery areas for juvenile fishes. So uh, this is where that fishery independent data come, becomes very important in determining where are the nursery habitats, what are the time periods of particular species in terms of what they need in habitat, food resources, um, and migration in order to become part of the adult stock. Um, that's where fishery independent data can determine for each species how you allow those, uh, or that, those individuals to grow up to be sexually mature to provide um, recruits to the following generations. And then there's recruitment over fishing. And so this is uh, basically, you're not only, re you're reducing basically the spawning stocks, so you're targeting the large individuals uh, to the extent where you 
aren't getting adequate replenishment through spawning uh, into the following generations. This often uh, targets both juveniles and adults. It's uh, difficult to assess if you don't know the life history parameters of the fish. Um, this is one. This is the one we look at now to try to establish what is the potential spawning stock biomass that is needed to build or uh, uh, build a sustainable fishery um, that has a specific level of fish mortality. Now, the bugaboo here is with fish mortality is you not only have the the commercial fishing effort in terms of what you're going to take out of the stock, but what we're trying to determine now with these types of recruitment over fishing concepts is assessing, well, what is the natural mortality of that ecosystem in terms of the predator-prey interactions aside in addition to um, what the commercial fishing mortality actually is. And so this is where we try to determine, well, what is the, what is the potential spawning stock uh, biomass that you need in order to account for both of those things, not only commercial mortality, but also um, natural mortality associated with food web interactions. And of course, so with these two concepts, there's lots of complicating factors, um, mostly the many of them man-made. Some of them are life history aspects of the species themselves. Um, most species can be divided into several stocks. Uh, I, I, what we'll see in the, in the next lecture is there are lots of different stocks and populations based on geography in the North Atlantic and the EU that you guys are going to have to uh, become familiar with. Um, and many of them are fished independently by different gear types and different nations and different efforts of nations. Uh, so I, I do not envy <laughs> your challenges ahead of you. Um, many of the species that you're dealing with, though, you got to keep in mind beyond the efforts of man in terms of commercial harvesting are... Um, highly migratory species, they move in between international borders, or national borders rather. So even demersal species can travel several hundred kilometers um, to spawning grounds. And, and between there, they might be fished by three or four different nations. Um, <clears throat> most fisheries um, are managed as a single species unit. And I think you know Pew and uh, many of the conservation NGOs are trying to push towards this multi-species um, fishery stock assessments and management that are, you know, directly reflect kind of ecosystem-based um, concepts, <clears throat> being holistic in the sense of not only accounting for fishing mortality from the commercial sector, but also what the ecosystem needs to thrive in terms of those predator-prey interactions. Um, okay. Now, <clears throat> When you guys are uh, dealing with these stock assessment guys, and there's two basic um, sets of issues to, to keep in mind, the questions you can ask yourself or ask people when you're dealing with these policy issues and with the fisheries managers, there's abundance issues of the various species themselves, and then there are fishery issues. So with abundance issues, it mainly has to do with life history characters, um, stock biomasses of the specific species. Um, what is the abundance of a particular species at a particular time? What is the trend in abundance? Is there things beyond the commercial fishing effort that's impacting it, such as climate change? Do we predict decreases in abundance associated with thermal, uh, uh, thermal uh, gradient changes in kind of ocean currents or whatever? Um, and this is the one that always gets that, you know, always people talk about, well, the spawning, uh, spawning potential biomass of this stock is, is 35%. Well, 35% of what? Um, for a lot of um, fisheries, particularly, I guess, in the United States and, and more in undeveloped nations around the world, is like there was no real good estimate of what the true spawning, the true unvert or virgin abundances and biomass of particular species were. So we're only catching up. Um, late in the game, after it's been fished for several decades, to determine what the original kind of biomass or abundance of that species was. Uh, fortunately, in the EU, in North Atlantic, there is a very long history of um, commercial fishing efforts so that you guys do have a kind of better sense of what the original biomass and abundances of certain species were. Um, so you have a, a pretty good benchmark that goes back a couple centuries now of what that was, um, and and 
not it's not necessarily a realistic goal to try to get back to that, but at least you know um, what your uh, what a more true measure of your current uh, spawning stock uh, mass may be. Uh, and so at set, at that point, this is where you're going to have to determine well, what is a realistic? Do we go back to the 1970s level or 1980s level to try to rebuild to that level of spawning uh, potential ratio, or do we downgrade it to some level and then from that level to determine what a kind of optimum optimum stock size is? So moving away from this maximum sustainable yield to an optimum uh, uh, optimum stock size, which um, allows for those predator-prey ecosystem interactions in addition to fishing effort. <coughs> Uh, blah, blah, blah. Okay, moving on. And then there are, of course, the fisheries issues. Um, <clears throat> what are the, what is the, basically the catch per unit effort of the various commercial fisheries, from the trawling fisheries to the pot fisheries to the longline fisheries? Because a lot of them, you know, your pots, your trawls, and your longlines are going to be catching some of the same species, uh, uh, and potentially in some of the same region and within some of the same populations. So what are the, you know, looking at where are the size and sexes of fish being caught and or discarded? Uh, what is the true portion of fish mortality from commercial efforts? And how does that match the natural mortality from the ecosystem? Um, what is the optimum fish size and mortality rate to, uh, to build a sustainable fishery? So um, this is size selectivity, how, you know, for a particular species, how big does it need to get to in order to produce the greatest amount of recruits uh, per generation? Um, uh, specific types of gear are more indiscriminate. Trawls are generally an indiscriminate, high bycatch type of fishery. There are many more selective fisheries out there that um, uh, will um, uh, more appropriately lead towards sustainable fisheries. Um, and how those will impact kind of reproductive capacity. And then finally, how do we kind of effectively regulate these harvesting so that ultimately we have a sustainable fishery that is has a kind of holistic approach to the ecosystem that is being, um, being fished. So, uh, any, I think that's the last slide. Any questions at that point? I think we got through it pretty good. This is what, yeah, just about an hour so. Um, you guys want to turn your mics on and ask me any questions or type any questions in the chat, I can uh, go back into the slides and address those. Otherwise, we can take you know, a 10-minute break or 5-minute break and move on to the next one. Justin, I have a question. Sure. Sometimes uh, when there is discussion about the fisheries or about models, uh, there's talk about proxies. Are these based on these um, the virgin abundance or is that? I mean, yeah, I don't, no. yeah. Yeah. So, so the pro the proxies are are estimates of the you know it's kind of a proxy is sort of a statistical parameter. It's identifying particular at life history aspects that you're assuming in the fishery. Because it's a proxy, it's not, its accuracy is dependent upon the source of the data, whether it's fishery independent or fishery dependent data. You're never going to know, uh, for most fisheries, we're, we're never going to know what the true kind of virgin unfished stock biomass is. Uh, but the longer you have in terms of the uh, historical um, records of your fishery, the better you're going to be able to uh, hone in on uh, at least a range within a particular proxy, whether it's um, spawn, you know, uh, recruits per individual, um, uh, what the optimum size is uh, that allows recruitment into the next generation. And we're going to get into the next lecture how important body size is for recruitment um, in, the, in the next lecture. So some of those proxies that are biological parameters that would be associated with kind of the population dynamics of a particular stock are highly dependent on that fishery dependent data often. Um, although we're getting better with the amount of fishery independent data in our, in our uh, survey skills to determine what those other proxies are that aren't necessarily associated with the fishery dependent data. So, um, look, you know, talking about like plankton toes and estimates of 
uh, food resource available to the standing, so that was predator-prey interactions, what biomass of food is available to a particular stock, and how that will affect survival, growth, um, and potential natural mortality. So those other proxies that are kind of fishery uh, independent data we're getting better at um, from a scientific standpoint. And those will help kind of shape the kind of understanding of what the true stock abundance or biomass is. <laughs> and we're going to get into the, um, the uh, somebody asked a question on email about, oh, well, if we don't fish this species, it's going to eat this other trophic level. And that is like the standard commercial fisherman, you know, fishery response to why we have to fish particular stocks. And it's, um, it's basically bogey. <laughs> and hopefully I'll convince you why that is in the next one. Okay, any other questions? Should we take a five minute break? Bathroom break or coffee, tea? Thing? Justin, it's Katie. Um, uh, I was wondering if uh, the next Google Hangout is going to be a separate Hangout, or are you going to like turn, take this off air and then put it back online? That's Just a great, wondering, yeah. great question. I think maybe we end this one and I start a new one. Is that, or, because this has been an hour, and I don't know if uh, there's a particular limit on how long YouTube can be. I mean, that's fine. It, everybody just joins like they did the first time. Makes or sense. We, can, we can keep this one going. It doesn't, I, I, if there's any limitation on the time, I just don't think there is. But. I don't think so. All right, well, why don't we leave this live? Um, there'll be a pause, and people can, can scroll through this if they want to view it later. Um, but why don't we take, like, I, I have to go to the men's room, so <laughs> why don't we take five minutes, and I will start back. Uh, what's the, what time do you have, Katie? Uh, it's just the top of the hour. Top of the hour. So why don't we reconvene at 11.05? Does that work for everybody? All right. All right, so this should, I'm going to keep this going, and we'll be able to return to the same broadcast. Okay, hopefully everybody got that. Okay. The C in five. The C in five. <laughs>
Okay, if everybody wants to give me a thumbs up that they're back, maybe on the chat, um, I'll get started. But you know, there's no rush. So. Um, we got we got Mike and we got Katie. Oh, you were taking off, Katie. I guess. So. Marcus, okay. Christina, Maria. Well, we should be able to get through the most of the case. It's mostly a resource for them. <clears throat> want to make sure uh, Uta and Catherine are back. And I think they are the ones that requested specific species, and this is going to be their big lecture. Catherine's here, okay, great. And uh, I owe my first slide to Ethan. Make sure she's here as well. Hopefully everybody sees first slide. Can anybody identify that species? Very good. Oh, Mike, I know. The cheap Mike, I know you know probably more about doing this stuff. So. Uh, yes, right, it is. It's a con. We'll figure out why it's a con. Yes, you were. I was 
expect nothing less. Cod, the fish that shaped the world. Um, okay, still waiting on Uta. Okay, great. Thank you, Catherine. So, um, ah, <laughs> good question. I know I'd have to take a I'd have to take a tissue sample, Mike, and send it to somebody that could differentiate. Cause I I actually have never caught a cod, unfortunately. Although I did, I did. Uh, I worked at Woods Hole for a while, but I was working on cephalopod, uh, building robotic squid and octopod, octopod, or actually training octopus to do particular tricks. Um, okay, well, so if Uda lets me know she's here, I'll get started, and we can uh, this, we should be able to finish this by the top VR as well, I think. And then um, I'm happy to stop the hangout and then answer any other questions. Okay, Uta, great. Glad you're here. Um, first slide is compliments of you. No worries. <laughs> All right, let's see. All right, so here we are. So Uta provided this with me uh, from ICES. Um, this is your uh, North Atlantic kind of food web biological interaction that includes commercial fishing. So um, this is what you guys are having to generally deal with, I think, in those mixed immersal trawl fisheries that you guys are going to be interacting with. So I think Uda and Catherine, maybe somebody else, sent me a list of species that they wanted to know more about or how to identify and um, particular aspects of stocks and populations. And, <laughs> From this great slide that Uta provided, we can see that there, there's haddock and cod and whiting, um, hake, uh, saith. These are, I think, a lot of the large um, uh, top-level fish or uh, apex predatory fish that are the targets of many of these trawl fisheries. Then we have some of the forage fish over here, so mackerel. The mackerel you have over there, scombra or scombrus, is a mid-level, so it would be a secondary consumer, um, tertiary consumer. Um, these guys are going to be your second, uh, your tertiary and quaternary consumers, um, apex predators, and then of course, you know, seals and sharks and porpoises will be the um, fifth level consumer predator, uh, along with seabirds. And then you have a lot of these other smaller um, forage species, sprat and herrings. Sea robins are a demersal um, forage fish that is often caught in trawls, uh, sand eels, Norway pout. So I'm going to cover about eight of these species and tell you why they are of, at particular trophic levels. Um, there are various um, life history characters in terms of um, how old they are before they mature, uh, how fecund they are. Fecundity is a measure of the uh, amount of eggs they can produce, a female can produce. Um, and who eats them and what they eat. Um, so thanks for providing this, Uta. This is a, this is a great slide and really helped me as a jumping off point. You'll notice at the bottom here it says in expected increases in stock abundance based on an individual species, either haddock, whiting, or cod, using a uh, maximum sustainable yield approach, MSY, maximum sustainable yield approach, are unlikely to occur simultaneously price, precisely because there are all these biological interactions. Competition between forage species for um, plankton food resources, competition between top level predators for the forage species, um, predation of, uh, of top level predators on forage species that affect other interactions. So this very complex marine food web you have in the North Atlantic um, is not gonna be um, sustainable using a maximum sustainable yield approach for any one particular species. We have to start moving towards an ecosystem-based approach that accounts for the natural mortality associated with all of these different interactions of competition and protection within this uh, North Atlantic um, marine food web structure. Does that make sense to everybody? Oops, okay. So there was a question that was sent um, by email regarding um, recruitment. Um, somebody mentioned that uh, they had heard that um, 
if, if you don't fish the biomass of a particular forage species down, it will end up consuming the eggs and recruits of other important commercial species at a higher trophic level and vice versa. Um, and this is something we hear in a lot of the commercial fisheries that they're doing a favor to the ecosystem by knocking down um, uh, 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 biomass of a forage species over a predatory species in order for the other respective uh, participant of that predator-prey interaction to increase in biomass or improve recruitment. And this is uh, rarely has um, strong scientific backing behind it. And it's primarily due to the fact that the plankton is a realm of kill and be killed. Um, it is the, the phase of a fish's life history that where it's very unlikely that it'll ever make it to not only a metamorphic stage, but an adult stage, and if not a, an adult stage, a spawning adult stage. So 90% of the larvae that enter um, the plankton phase uh, never make it out. They're eaten by something, or they starve to death, or, um, yeah, and basically they either starve to death or they're eaten by something. So the, the mortality at the plankton phase is tremendous, and it's basically these three levels that are impacting it. When you end up in the plankton for any particular species, it's a very patchy environment, and you're so small, right, and, uh, and often subject to the whimsy of whatever nutrients are available or whatever food sources are available, that often um, you won't uh, finish development and you basically die from starvation. So it's a very limited, patchy distribution of um, resources available in a plankton. In the plankton. Um, and now there are two basic uh, types of uh, plankton that enter into the, the pelagic zone. There's planktotrophic larvae and there's lesithotrophic larvae. You can consider these, one is an active swimming feeding plankton, the other is a plankton that doesn't do a lot of swimming, um, doesn't really feed, it has a yolk sac already um, built into its development so that it basically uses the yolk sac nutrients to develop and metamorphose out of the larval phase. And so these are very um, kind of opposite, end spectrum, opposite ends of the spectrum in terms of um, how different fish species survive the plankton phase. And they have different advantages and disadvantages to you. So let me back up. I didn't think we got to um, cover this in the last um, lecture. So, um, so planktonic trophy, planktotrophic troph uh, planktotrophic larvae, sorry, <laughs> are very small. They have no little to no yolk sac. They're very active. They can actually swim against currents, and they're dependent on food available in that pelagic zone to actually grow. Now, it was thought for many years that planktotrophic um, larvae were at the whim of current regimes. And it turns out there's more and more science out there that's showing that these active feeding larvae that can swim um, are actually quite good at resisting current regimes and self-seeding their home habitats or home reefs. Um, so more and more science is showing that certain species are able to are not necessarily at the whim of the currents or drifting along haplessly in the seas, that they actually can home into their home habitats and reefs um, through being so active. Now there are, uh, with planktotrophic larvae, uh, oh, no, I'm sorry, let me go. Uh, less of the trophic tar tro uh, larvae, sorry, I'm getting tongue tied here, um, are, they're fewer in number, they, they don't have as many um, uh, hatchlings. They have a large yolk sac and they're not dependent on any nutrition from the water column. So they're able to develop simply from the nutrition and nutrients provided by um, the egg of, of the mother. Uh, and then there's finally there's direct development, um, which uh, direct directly from an egg into a juvenile stage. And you can obviously see what the different um, advantages and disadvantages are. With a planktotrophic larvae, you have a long period of time in the planktonic stage, often weeks, if not sometimes months, before, depending on the species, before you'll come out of the planktonic phase and settle onto um, the adult uh, habitat areas. Um, you are subject to starvation. 
Uh, because you're so small and you're in that plankton phase in the pelagic for so long, you actually have a high mortality rate due to predation. Um, but this, the, 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 the scheme here by species that have planktotrophic trophy is you put out lots and lots and lots and lots of individuals, so you swamp the predation component of the planktonic phase, and hopefully a few, maybe 10% of those uh, individuals that hatch uh, are able to metamorphose and make it into the adult stage for any one individual spawner. Um, another thing that's uh, a characteristic of planktotrophics is they have a very high dispersal rate, so they can have the adults will generally have large geographic ranges. Uh, less epitrophic uh, larvae uh, spend a much shorter time in the plankton, uh, which means they're, they're much, uh, they have much lower mortality rates at the planktonic phase, um, even though the planktonic phase is a place that is rife with uh, predators. Um, there are fewer recruits. Um, they're more costly produced because mothers are providing such a uh, nutrient-rich egg yolk set to the, uh, the hatchlings. Um, and because they're not in the planktonic phase as long, they generally have uh, lower dispersal uh, capabilities. So those are the two basic larval types that we find in um, the plankton. We go back to this. Um, any questions on that? So we can see, oh, sorry. Couldn't see the slides, okay. Um, let's see. Uh, so those are, these are the two offsides. And this is uh, loaded up on Dropbox, so you guys can, um, can go through um, these slides at a later time. Hopefully Marcus won't delete them this time and be able to provide you these PowerPoints. So there's four PowerPoints in Dropbox that um, you can request from Marcus and he can forward them to you. So you'll have these slides at your leisure to review your leisure now. Yeah. Okay, so I'm going to exit. This was the Nectonic um, PowerPoint. Now we're going back to our. Um, and so, also in this PowerPoint, there are lots of web links that'll take you. This takes you to a Wikipedia page on planktonic larvae. Um, so beside the two strategies of a planktonic larvae, and in fact, it's a very limited set of potential food resources in the plankton and the pelagic realm, um, the most important aspect is that there's this incredibly high predation intensity, and it comes from every direction. There are, of course, planktivorous fishes, like the clupeids, the herrings, the mackerels, and those types of things, which are filter feeders. Um, species of krills feed on not only phytoplankton, but will also feed on small zooplankton, so the first developmental stages of crustaceans as well as larval fishes can be subject to krill predation. Jellyfishes. Uh, jellyfishes and tenophores. Is, tenophore is a type of jellyfish known as a, um, um, it's a, um, a comb. Um, and you'll see in depauperate um, uh, habitats, uh, where lots of eutrophication has gone on, jellyfishes can swamp a system, and the predation rate of jellyfishes and tenophores and the like can really wipe out and impact larval recruitment of not only fishes, but as well um, important uh, commercial uh, shell fisheries as well. So these are a massive component of predation uh, as a planktivore. Then, of course, there are baleen whales and, and you know things like filter-feeding sharks and other filter-feeding fishes similar to um, the herrings, and, but these are just the, the kind of large uh, planktivorous Pacific predators. Within the plankton, there are zooplanktivore predators as well. One of the most efficient and ubiquitous predators is known as the arrowworm. It's called a ketognath. These things are incredible predators, uh, incredible zooplankton predators that will feed on larval fishes, larval crustaceans, um, a very active predator. <laughs> so it's more like that. I don't eggs, yes. Um, <clears throat> then you have ichthyoplankton. So during development of a lot of these planktotrophic larvae, the ones that are actively swim and uh, need to feed the resources, you have incredible predation rates by particular species of fish. I'll show you that in the next slide. 
Of course, there are larval crustaceans that are predators, and uh, crab larvae in particular. And then you have uh, specific um, mollusk predators, pteropods, which are these very, very tiny marine snails which feed on a lot of uh, plankton as well. So even within plankton, plankton aren't just these hapless kind of, you know, floating around. There are also massive amounts of uh, predator-prey interactions going on between plankton themselves beyond the planktivorous jellyfishes, whales, sharks, and other large adult fishes. So keep that in mind when you get these stories that you're, they're impacting recruitment. Let me show you what they look like. So here's a great example of ichthyoplankton. This is one of my favorites. This is the developmental stages uh, on the far left here of a um, yellowfin tuna, Thunus albicaries. And you can see it, the even very small postmate has a huge eye and a tremendous mouth. Big eye, big mouth, small body. Big eye, big mouth, small body. And then only when it metamorphoses does the body finally catch up, developing that kind of forked caudal fin to allow it to, uh, for its high speed, uh, efficient cruising, swimming speeds, and its basic uh, dorsal fin, pectoral fins that help it maneuver very well. But you'll see the mouth shrinks relative to the size of the head. So here's an actual larvae with its mouth open, and this is a larval tuna. So this thing, as a planktotrophic larvae, is just going around eating everything it comes across. It has a big eye so it can spot other larvae, and it has a giant mouth so it can consume anything it can get its head around. Okay, uh, Katie wants me to remind her about it. Phytoplankton are tiny floating plants, so these are the dinoflagellates that can photosynthesize, diatoms that photosynthesize. These are um, phytoplankton are the autotrophs. They use sunlight to generate energy and grow. Zooplankton are those animals that not only feed on the phytoplankton, but they feed on each other as well. Um, and these are the examples of some of the zooplankton predators. We have ichthyoplankton, like the little tuna. And then here's the arrowworm, that ketognath. This is a rapacious predator of plank plankton. And look, so here's its body. It's, it's translucent, basically invisible. These are egg sacs down here. But when you get a close-up, here's an electro-scanning micrograph of the head. It has these giant raptorial appendages, and it goes up and grasps onto, it'll, it'll eat these tuna, it'll eat uh, crustaceans, it'll basically eat anything it can get its raptorial appendages around. So this is a head, so it's kind of a scary, alien-looking thing that you might see in a movie. Um, but these are uh, in high densities and ubiquitous throughout the uh, world's oceans um, and uh, a tremendous predator of plankton um, themselves. And then, of course, you have the adult um, filter-feeding planktivores. These planktivores are adult organisms that feed specifically on plankton and not actually plankton themselves. Um, ichthyoplankton, sorry Marcus, ichthyoplankton is just a subset of zooplankton. Zooplankton includes all animals. Ichthyoplankton are those plankton that are fish. So a fish plankton that, feed, that is uh, planktotrophic, like this tuna, right, will feed on other zooplankton. Other, even other ichthyoplankton while it's in its planktonic phase until it settles out and becomes metamorphosis into the adult form. Does that work for everybody? <laughs> okay, so then in the North Atlantic you have very efficient filter feeding uh, top level predators like basking sharks. Uh, minke whales, those baleen whales that use those, uh, their honey, uh, the baleen in their mouths to filter out um, organisms and they can feed on very tiny uh, larval ichthyoplankton as well as uh, larval crustaceans. Um, both of these animals are very efficient filter feeding um, uh, top level predators that are specifically feeding on plankton. So <laughs> the argument that there is no, um, that you know, fishing down a forage fish that's feeding on the ichthyoplankton of another commercially important species is. Um, generally unfounded by kind of the understanding of how the, uh, the food web within the planktonic phase is actually working. Mortality is uh, replete and abundant within that phase for all organisms. Now, 
with some of the fisheries you're going to be looking at, um, you do have planktivorous species that are commercially important. For example, anchovies and herrings. These are clupeid plankton. We'll learn what clupeid is in a, in a few moments. Um, but one thing I'll point out is different planktivorous species actually have different feeding abilities and, and, and target sub, different subsets of uh, the planktonic realm. So anchovies, uh, anchoa is the, is the genus, are what we call ram filter feeders. And what you'll see is they have a somewhat subterminal mouth, but they have a tremendous gape, similar to that, that larval tuna, but these are much larger than the larval tuna. And as a ram filter feeder, they, in, they open their jaws in this massive gape, and then they have these gill rakers that are inside, uh, that are part of their modified gill. So you can see the, um, the gill filaments here, which are red, so those are where they're um, pulling oxygen out of the water column. But in front of them, they have these um, what are known as gill rakers, similar to those appendages on the um, arrowworm, that are sieving out plankton out of the water column. And you can think of an anchovy sort of as a trawler. It goes along, swimming along with its mouth wide open, and is consuming whatever plankton phytoplankton or zooplankton otherwise um, is is sieving through its gills. So it's kind of almost like a trawler, like a, a small uh, forage fish trawler consuming all the plankton that's in the water column. Um, Non-selective kind of planktonic feeder anchovies. In contrast, herring, which are close relatives of anchovies, have, you can see, a much smaller uh, mouth, a much smaller gape. That's the size of the mouth. It's, um, it's kind of terminal and upturned a little bit. Um, these are what are known as facultative filter feeders. So these guys can actually switch between swimming along like this and kind of consuming whatever very tiny particles are in the water column. So if they're really, really tiny particles, they'll open their mouths like phytoplankton. Phytoplankton are some of the smallest um, plankton out there. Um, a herring, if it comes into a very dense that uh, patch of uh, phytoplankton, those autotrophic um, plants that are in the uh, pelagic zone, they can open their mouth and swim along kind of like an anchovy and filter them out through their gills. But these guys, the herring, generally prefer to feed on larger zooplankton. And they will do that by selectively suction feeding on calanoid copepods and uh, uh, larval uh, crustaceans and even some larger ichthyoplankton when they come across. So they'll use really incredible eyesight um, and they actually have excellent hearing as well um, to detect the motions and uh, sounds of some of the plankton and they'll go up and selectively pop their mouth open and suck in an individual um, zooplankton prey item. Um, so we have kind of two different strategies here, a, a non-selective strategy and a selective strategy between uh, what are known as clupeid planktivores. And these are uh, quite important commercial fisheries um, in the North Atlantic and EU area in some areas. <laughs> Sorry about that. Okay. Now, the next concept I want to uh, get you guys to kind of grasp, which I think is a really important thing when you're when you're talking about fisheries policy and um, stock biomass and uh, optimum size of <coughs> uh, uh, fish catches, is this concept of how body size in, in fish species is related to fecundity. Now, assuming within a species the shape and density of muscle tissue does not change as the fish gets larger, um, there's a concept known in allometry uh, that basically if you look at the length of a fish, right, the volume of that fish will uh, increase to the cube of, a, of its length. So this is what this basically says. In fisheries data, a lot of times you, you get length data from fish, how long they are from, from the, their head to their tail. Um, and what that tells you is um, using, if you know the length of a fish and you know this, what is a, this is a species specific constant K, which is basically their growth rate, you can determine what the volume or mass of that fish is. And what you'll note here from this very simple relationship is as length increases, the mass of a fish increases exponentially. So from a 50 centimeter cod here to a 100 centimeter cod here, 
basically the mass of that fish is increasing fivefold by just a doubling of its length. Is that is, is that clear with everybody? So as the length of a fish increases, the volume or mass of that fish increases to the cube of that power. Right? Because length is a linear dimension, volume is a cubic dimension. Right? And volume, and for most intents and purposes, the density of fish muscle is just slightly denser than water. Right? So we can uh, make the simple assumption that weight basically is equal to the cube of a fish's length if we know the species specific constant of how it grows. Okay? Yes, that's correct. Uda. The exponent is three. It's the cube of length. Right? And what does this mean though for fecundity? Can anybody guess? Well, as a fish gets lo longer, it's exponentially getting larger in terms of its body cavity. And this is really important for fisheries reproduction. Larger fish essentially make better mothers. So a single fish, and here we have, this is the red snapper, Lugenis campanchis, which is a very important reef fish species that we have here in the Gulf of Mexico in the, um, Atlant in the southern Atlantic Ocean region. Um, very popular game fish or recreational fish, as well as commercial fish. Lives in relatively deep water. Lives to be upwards of 40 years old. Um, doesn't probably start spawning until it's in its teens to 20 year old. But a single red snapper that is 20, female red snapper that is 24 inches, basically, and about an eight year old fish, uh, produces as many eggs as 212 17 inch fish. Think about that. And that's basically because we have this un understanding that basically as a fish gets longer, its volume of its body cavity where it can actually produce these eggs, this area here where the actual ovaries are increases exponentially in terms of the size of the cavity, meaning you can produce more eggs per individual. And it actually increases at an exponential rate. And generally, these larger fish end up producing more nutritionally larger eggs, more nutritional larger eggs, which is basically an artifact of passing on successful genes to future generations. So when we're looking at stock sizes and size of individuals within a stock, the more we can protect those larger female fish, the better off future generations are going to be because they're going to put more spawn into that future generation and you're going to have a, a higher likelihood of recruitment back into that fishery for better chilling. Yes, right. So, so these are all the same species. Yes, so this is 212 of the same species, but one 24-inch fish can produce as many eggs as 212 17-inch fish. Did I answer your question, Catherine? So, I mean, it, it's, it's, it's kind of mind-boggling. But it comes down to the simple concept that volume is the cube of length. Um, so bigger fish, if we can have you know restrictions on leaving larger mothers out there, you're going to be able to recruit into the fishery better. Does that make sense, everybody? Okay. So moving on. Um, um, I had another um, thing I want to show. You. All right, so basically you guys sent me eight species, um, which included the cod, the hake, haddock, um, ling, uh, place, sole, um, mackerel, and herring, which I think are part of your main complex for your uh, various demersal fisheries. So what I'm going to do here is kind of walk you through uh, kind of fish classification of where these fish fall out in terms of their relationships to each other, how to identify them. I remember somebody said, I want to know that I'm looking at a cod and not a place. Um, so hopefully we'll, by the end of this kind of taxonomic lecture, you'll be able to identify those things. And this is also, the rest of this lecture is also going to be a good resource for you guys to save. And if you need to find something out about a particular species, I have links that are embedded within this that will let you... Um, and why are they called what they are called? Yes, and why they are called what they are called. Um, so that's um, where we're heading to right here, Uda. So um, all the cod, haddock, hake, and ling um, in your fishery all fall under uh, the order Gadiformes. Gadiformes is that group of fish 
that includes these kind of basal, um, what are called um, proacanthopterygian fishes, meaning they have no dorsal spines or no spines in any of their fins. Now, this group, the Gadiformes, have, is a tremendously important commercial fishery. It's over a quarter of the world's marine catch, and it's second only to the Copaiformes, which we'll talk about in a minute, in terms of the total volume of catches historically. Now, it's not an incredibly diverse group, but it has, there's some argument, there are nine to ten different families. So with each, cod, hake, haddock, and ling are each from a different family, but all those families fall within the order gadiformi, so those cod-like fishes. And what a, co a gadiform-like fish is, is basically defined by these anatomical characteristics here that I'm uh, circling with the arrow. Um, <clears throat> what you have is you have multiple dorsal fins, none of them which have hard bony parts in them. So they're all flexible soft fins. They have a set of pelvic fins which are on the bottom of the fish that are actually anterior or towards the nose, towards the rostrum of the fish in front of their pectoral fins. Now the pectoral fins you can think of as your arms, right? The pelvic fins are kind of your belly button region, right? And then of course they have a pair of anal fins. Now None of these fins have spine. Another important aspect of the gadiforms is they have a what is known as a protractile upper jaw. That means their jaw can extend away from their head, and this makes for what we call in functional pathology a very efficient suction feeding fishes. So they actually generate a suction pulse of water that they draw in like they're sucking through a straw, because they can extend their jaws away from their head, create a tube and then draw water into the mouth very, very rapidly. And they use that to engulf prey items. And that's how they use That's called suction feeding. Um, and often within gadiforms, you'll find that they have these sensory chin barbels present. Now, why would they have this present? You'll see that the mouth is generally, in, in, in many species, what we call subternal it means it's kind of towards the bottom of the fish or the uh, ventral side of the fish. They use these sensory barbels to detect or feel for prey item that prey items that might be embedded or dug down in fondly into the substrate. So these are the main characteristics of what we see in a gadiform fish. Now, as we go through the species, oops, sorry, wrong way. Now, this is, I know there's a lot of information on here. We're not going to cover a lot of this. I'm going to let you guys kind of go through this uh, at your leisure and review when you're um, having questions. So this is meant to provide you kind of a basic um, background of the habitat, life history, and you'll see here predator-prey interactions and um, some notes on fishery stocks, populations, and resource links. And I'm going to walk you through this first species, the cod, which is very famous. Um, so I have uh, two slides for each of the species that you guys sent me. Um, the first thing here you see here, this is a hyperlink. This will take you to, let me see here, this will take you to fish base, which is here. And this is what every good fish scientist, marine biologist used to, to kind of walk through the basic parameters or basic life history characters, biological parameters, distributions, descriptions, um, biology of any species. Fish base is the kind of primary source you want to go. Here it shows you the kind of ranges it's found. Here's a, a picture of the species. You can click here, and it'll take you to a suite of Google images for that species. Uh, the Atlantic cod, Gaddis marua, it tells you who identified it when. And then as you go through here, you can see how it's classified. So even though it's a gadiform fish, you can see it falls within the family gadidae, which are the cods and haddocks. You can get estimates of its um, basic habitat and range in terms of latitude and longitude. You can get estimates of its life history character, size, age, weight, sh short description of how you describe the species from its morphology, um, distribution, various distribution, various notes on its biology, and um, whether it's listed IUCN, blah, 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 as well as these important 
sublinks to the FAO, FAO species profile, um, the fisheries uh, species profile, firms, which is stock assessments, and fisheries wikis. And then a series of links that will take you to various aspects of food items, predators, age and growth uh, statistics. Uh, these are actually equations showing you how length and weight or volume change, how that grows for that specific species. And some species have uh, more of these than others. But this is an incredibly powerful web page for you to guys to get any um, basic sets of resources. But, because I'm such a nice guy, I have done a lot of that for you already. So most of this information here is directly from this sets of pages that I showed you. And what you will see with cod is it's a benthopelagic predator. It likes kind of complex habitats. Um, here's its temperature range, its depth range. What you'll see here, here's some information, important information in life history I think you guys will probably want to refer to um, as you're discussing these in some of the stock assessments are these biological parameters or proxies. Gonochoristic. Gonochoristic, all the species you guys deal with are gonochoristic, meaning they have separate sexes. They have male and female sexes. You don't have any hermaphroditic species, at least with the list you gave me. This, uh, <coughs> um, this parameter here, mean LM, is the length at maturity. So at 63.4 centimeters total length is uh, generally when this species reaches sexual maturity and starts to spawn. Um, the crazy thing about cod is they are one of the most prodigious spawners in the world. So a five kilogram fish will generate about two and a half million eggs. A 34 kilogram fish will generate about nine million eggs. One of the most prodigious uh, uh, batch spawners there are in, in, among fishes and that's why when they first were started exploited there are stories when the new world was discovered off Nova Scotia that you could practically walk across the backs of the cod that were over a meter in size sometimes close to two meters in size walk across their backs between the bays around Newfoundland in New England um, a pretend uh, very prodigious fish <laughs> as we um, and here's some more important parameters. Sometimes I was able to garner aspects of the larval pelagic phase. So it spends about three months in the larval phase. So it's subject to a lot of planktonic mortality. Um, but that will be temperature dependent. So um, temperature has a lot to do with how quickly um, these fish will go through development and in metamorphose, as well as the amount of food resources that are available to them. Um, here's the max age of these fish. They generally grow about 60 centimeters by three years. Oh. Uh, question. Okay, no, I'm really just trying. Okay, is it true that cod prefer cold, cold water because that could be effective? It turns out, um, Justina, that cod actually have a pretty broad set of temperature ranges that they can uh, live in. Um, as climate change increases uh, sea surface temperatures, um, because they have a habitat that goes all the way, you'll see here if you look under habitat, their habitat extends all the way from the shoreline to a meter of water down the continental slope to several hundred meters and they're generally caught in that 150 to 200 meter range where you find complex rocky boulder seagrass beds but as the oceans start to warm they're going to start expanding their range farther farther into the arctic um, and decreasing their range in those more southerly latitudes as those temperatures get higher than 20 degrees so even though they have a relatively large thermal tolerance in terms of cold waters um, they are going to start expanding the range northerly and probably decreasing the range southerly, but you know how long that is going to take over the decades is um, seems not to have exponential only about four times more eggs. Yes, so um, Marcus, you're correct that um, the uh, not necessarily exponential fecundity, but exponential mass. So it depends on how much of their uh, each species dedicates a different amount of their resources to either growth and body size or to um, uh, spawning potential in terms of over reproduction. So there's always a species specific variation between that, um, those two um, that you have to account for. Um, what else can we talk about here? Oh, these two levels down here. Um, I'm sorry, you guys aren't seeing this as a whole picture. Sorry, my bad. Um, 
Population doubling time. This is an estimate of resilience of a population uh, because they have cod have generally fast growth rates. Um, they're rather large, uh, have kind of high fecundities. Um, left alone uh, and decreases in fishing mortality. Their populations can redouble, uh, providing that everything else in the ecosystem is functioning appropriately, that there are enough food resources for not only the planktonic phase, but all the, also the appropriate habitat for the juvenile nursery stages, as well as the adult stages. Populations can respond within about four years and double their size. Um, so these are kind of important. And you can see this trophic level here, 4.4. It's a, uh, a fourth level consumer. Um, towards the top of the food chain, only things that uh, you'll see in the next phase. So when we go down to the next phase, here we have the various predator-prey interactions. Um, <coughs> sorry, let me get a drink of water here. So I've listed some of the, the predatory behaviors. They generally are what we call crepuscular Predators, crepuscular means they feed at twilight times and nocturnally. So they start to become uh, actively feeding as the sun sets and as the sun rises are their kind of predominant feeding times, even though they'll feed throughout the night. They're omnivorous. They feed on various benthic organisms, crustaceans, starfishes, um, fishes, including smaller young cod. So there is a, a, a significant amount of cannibalism that can occur within populations. If there aren't enough food resources other than juvenile cod, they will cannibalize to some uh, significant extent. Um, they form dense schools during the day in those kind of mid-water clumps. So these are very subject to kind of demersal trawls, diurnal or daytime demersal trawls. And then they'll end up heading down to the seafloor and disperse at night feeding on the bottom. So they're benthic kind of predators feeding on or near the bottom. And they feed on a, a variety of things. Now, if you click this link here, this link here, I'll show you. I didn't want to have to do it. Um, it'll take you to directly to the fish base link that shows you um, all the prey that have been documented for cod. So the food name, uh, type of food, um, whether it's a finfish, mollusk, worm, uh, echinoderm, which is the starfishes and sea urchins. Um, and then it will tell you where that prey was documented and whether it was at an adult or recruit stage or adult and juvenile stage. Um, so a lot of information here um, to be gleaned on what these, um, what cod feed on. And I, I just kind of picked some of the main categories. So that is a link that's embedded there. And similarly, I have a similar link for the predators. It'll take you to another web page that links you to what actually feeds on cod. Juvenile cod are very susceptible to octopod or octopus predation, as well as I mentioned cannibalism, and a variety of apex predators feed on cod, including bluefin tuna, swordfish, uh, sea and sea lions, whales, and various harbor porpoises, lots of sharks raised, dogfish are a big predator of uh, Subadult and juvenile cod. Um, Clupeids now will feed on the ichthyoplankton larval stages of cod. Um, various flat fishes and rock fishes as well. And <clears throat> below here, you'll see that we have, I've put in a couple of notes regarding either stocks or populations. Um, you'll see cod seasonally migrate between spawning, feeding over wintering areas. Um, usually within their respective stock boundaries. So there's not a lot of migration that goes on within cod. So you, and it, for, for cod, you have kind of more distinct uh, population variations within uh, different regions, which is, I guess, good or bad. That's why the Norwegians, with their strong, um, uh, I think they have stronger conservation measurements for cod in terms of reducing capoing forage fisheries to provide enough food for cod has allowed their cod population to rebound relatively recently. Um, and you also see um, that their distributions are very much linked to prey abundances and, and 
their prey abundance and distribution more so than any kind of temperature regime. So these are these are quite um, flexible or adaptable species. They go into they can go into freshwater river mouths. They can go into the deep sea. Um, so uh, a Uri haline species, meaning it can it can um, uh, uh, survive in several different levels of salinities. Um, so a, a pretty robust fish, if not for the massive amount of commercial fishing mortality that we've imposed on it over the several centuries. Now below here you'll see these three links, which are probably things you guys are going to want to pay attention to as you go through uh, this PowerPoint, probably save them to your bookmarks, but I'll walk you through them really quickly here. Um, the firm's area is the fisheries resource monitoring system. Each one of these links allows you to look at um, the recent data sets regarding specific stock populations. So if we go to, anybody want to pick one for me? All right, this question, oh, I'm sorry. No, not all gat, I'm sorry. Okay, so Irene had a question, do all cataforms have a swim bladder? No, not all uh, gataforms do have a swim bladder. One aspect which I didn't think anybody would be held that interesting is Gataforms do not have a pneumatic duct connection between the swim bladder and their inner in their uh, gut, so they actually have a um, uh, distinct swim bladder that's not connected to their esophagus. But I didn't I thought that was a little bit too much information. Um, but not all species of gataforms actually have a swim bladder. Some in some species, very deep species, it's reduced and not necessarily not present. Okay, cod north sea. Hard to see them. Okay, so everyone wants the Celtic Sea, Buddha wants the Cod North Sea. Um, uh, Cod North Sea, English Channel Skagerrak. How about that? So we hit this link. Hopefully my internet's working. It'll show you the actual range in purple here of that stock, what region we're talking about. Um, and it'll give you kind of the basic habitat and biology this is for all species, not, not, not necessarily specific to that stock, um, but it can tell you the statistics of that North Sea fishing mortality, spawning stock biomass, recruitment at age one, so these are the ones that are coming out of the plankton, recruiting to the juvenile and sub-adult habitats, uh, total removals in terms of discards, landings, um, and unallocated. Um, so these are some important, I think, graphs that you guys want to be able to have access to regarding um, those models. Does anybody have a question? Also fine. Can you increase your screen font size? Uh, not without getting out of the, um, <laughs> I think, without getting out of my Explorer and restarting my computer. Um, so these links are embedded within the PowerPoint, so you should be able to access them quite readily. I, I was just going to use this as a, as a way of showing you how to kind of link to these things. Um, it's embedded in the PowerPoint, and then once you go to PowerPoint, you can save these bookmarks for yourself, for your, the particular areas you're interested in. Um, so this is the fishery resource monitoring system. Each species has this. This is the fisheries wiki, which also has a set of uh, resource profiles for various regions from the Bering Sea to the Eastern Scotian Cell, Faroe Bank, Gulf of Maine, Iceland, Irish Sea. Um, and then finally, this is another uh, 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 interesting website that kind of is uh, synonymous somewhat in a lot of what it uh, displays to fish base. Um, to tell you, sometimes it gets a little bit more into details of particular species. Major spawning area in the eastern Atlantic is the North Sea, generally at depths of less than 50 meters and never beyond 200 meters, especially in Bornholm Basin, Denmark, where the egg density appears to be rather high. The most productive spawning ground in the western Atlantic and the eastern half of Georgia's Bank, blah, blah, blah. Um, so this is a really important resource that will, again, have some fishery statistics either at the, level, at the global scale for you uh, to review. So hopefully these sets of resources will uh, get you guys uh, primed for your policy discussions. Any, any other questions regarding the links? I'll go back to the PowerPoint. So that's COD. And 
Any questions on Cobb before we move on? Uh, let me. Okay, no questions on Cod. Um, so here we have, so I've, within the GATA forms, I've put each of these species in terms of decreasing body size or trophic level. So Ling, Mulva Mulva, is the uh, next trophic level. You'll see it's, um, it's generally found at deeper depths than Cod. Um, it's also gonochristic. It has a much larger, you'll see here, has a much larger mean uh, length at maturity. Uh, it can take five to six years. Males mature a little bit earlier than females, but it is even more prodigious in terms of egg production than cod. 20 to 60 million eggs estimated for an uh, adult mature female. Um, the spawning generally occurs from March to July depending on the geography and water temperatures. It has a relatively fast growth rate. It gets to be relatively about the same age as a cod, 25 years old. Uh, generally between 10 and 14 years old, females generally live longer. Uh, but the important thing here is it has a much lower resilience. Um, so in terms of population doubling time, uh, divorced of any commercial fishing efforts, it takes a much longer time for populations to recover. You'll see its trophic level is just below cod. It's actually much more of a demersal feeder. Um, but what this means, essentially, is that uh, some aspects of its biology prevent it from recruiting, at least having strong recruitment levels back into the fishery, uh, primarily because it takes probably a little bit longer to reach sexual maturity than um, the cod and other species. So it has to get bigger before it can start spawning. Um, prey items, uh, you'll see it's actually... Um, quite a uh, strong predator of squid. Squid is an important part of its diet, as well as other cods and herrings and flatfishes. You'll see it's a cod because it's, you know, it's got its uh, chin barbel, rounded fins, two fins. It has its pelvic fins directly below or slightly in front of the pectoral fins. No spiny points. And this fish is actually does not have, um, I, I think it has a highly reduced swim bladder to answer your question, um, Irene. Um, uh, here are some of its spawning areas, and again, uh, the fishing methods it's subject to are trawls, long lines, gill nets, hand lines. It has a relatively large uh, range. Again, you'll have the Wiki um, resource monitoring system and FAO fact sheets available to click through to the links. I don't want to do it because it might freeze my computer, um, but you have all these sets of resources for the same sets of species. Uh, moving on to the European hake, another gadiform fish, uh, Merlucius merlucius. Um, uh, it's a, uh, a little bit shallower. It has an, uh, a much smaller body size by the time it reaches maturity. Um, but again, it has a slower growth rate. It takes between five and seven years for it to reach that size. So in order to become a sexually mature individual, it takes between five and seven years. It has a decent set of uh, fecundity in terms of egg production, um, but because it takes a while to grow, um, is a hake also a gap on? Yes. All hakes, all haddocks, all cods, all wings are, um, it, it looks like it has a spine, but it actually doesn't. These are actually soft rays. Uh, no spine. <laughs> These are all soft rays. They can be somewhat silver, but they don't have a true bony spine. Um, Gadiforms lack true bony spines in their fins. Um, anyway, so this species is actually um, one to be concerned about because it has a low resilience in terms of population doubling time. It's actually an upper level uh, predator. It has a very kind of high trophic level in that it, you can see here that it actually, for its body size, it has uh, quite a large mouth, meaning it has a large gape so it can consume larger prey items. So if we look at its prey, it feeds on squid, a lot of squid and cuttlefish. It'll feed on hakes, uh, other hakes and cod, so there is some level of cannibalism. It feeds a lot on forage species. Um, and the juveniles will feed particularly on crustaceans. So it'll go through this ontogenic diet shift. Juveniles will feed uh, near the bottom, feeding on infaunal crustaceans and euphosids, especially coming out of the larval phases. 
and then it fishes almost predominantly to squid and fishes. Lots of different predators feed on them. Um, again, we have varying spawning periods. Um, main fishing grounds are off Scotland and Ireland. Bay of Biscay, which I'm not, I don't, I don't actually know where that is. Um, maybe I'm assuming, assuming one of you guys do. Um, should, sounds like it's one of your major fisheries, actually, from the research done on this. Um, it's subject to various fishing methods, from trawls to long lines and, and bottom gill nets, as well as Danish seines. Um, and then haddock. Haddock is another gadiform fish from another family, uh, Melanagros et, et agil finis. Um, another gonochristic, so separate sexes. It's a shallower species generally. Um, it likes rocky, sandy bottoms. Um, this fish is actually has uh, medium resilience, so it it's, uh, responds uh, more readily to fishing pressures because it has a, a slightly faster growth rate, has a mean smaller uh, uh, size at maturity, only takes about two to three years for it to reach sexual maturity compared to the species before that, which can take five, six, and sometimes ten years. Um, uh, Less, it's got a smaller amount of fecundity, but that is related to the fact that it's actually generally a smaller species. So it doesn't get as large, it doesn't have as much room for egg production as we understood from the fact that body size and length are a uh, function of the cube. And it is at a lower trophic level, mainly because it's a smaller species. Uh, prey items, it's generally a solitary predator, eats a lot of uh, in faunal benthic organisms, crustaceans, mollusks, uh, sea stars, a lot of polychaetes. Polychaetes are a marine worm that uh, dig into sediments. Um, it will also eat a fair amount of forage species, so it eats those smaller forage species. Unlike the gadiform fish before it, the ling, um, the hake, and the cod, which become rather large predators, are at a higher trophic level to eat larger prey items. These guys are eating much smaller prey items in general, particularly when it comes to um, when it consumes fishes, it's eating a higher percentage of those small forage species. Now, moving on to the next order are, is Pleuronectiformes. These are the flatfishes. You guys have two main commercial fisheries of flatfishes, which are the place and the sole. Um, these are easily identifiable. Everybody should be able to um, easily identifiable because they are asymmetrical. They go through a massive asymmetrical metamorphosis, either what we call a left-handed sinistral or dextral right-handed migration of one of the eyes to the opposite side of the head along with the co-committed fins so that it has a bottom side to its body, which is usually right, and a top side which is usually camouflage and able to respond to changes in uh, not only um, uh, uh, surrounding substrate, so it's very chameleon-like. It actually can change its color patterns on its skin as well as its tones to blend into its environment. So it's a very cryptic fish. Uh, it can hide really well. So those are pleuronectiformes, flat fishes. <clears throat> All the same kind of data is provided for each of these um, each of these species. Um, the thing about the flatfishes is, is that they are a demersal benthic feeding fish, so they're going to stay towards on the bottom. They're going to be subject to trawl fisheries. Um, the place now has a really large habitat zone and that you'll find awful often in, in tidal areas. So sometimes even when the tide goes out, you'll find small pools and place will actually stay in a small pool below um, above the tide line and, and wait for the tide to return. It can actually <laughs> wait out a tide uh, along in, in the intertidal zone. <laughs> it prefers mud and sandy bottoms where it can blend in with its colorations. Um, you'll find it a lot in your estuaries and beaches. Um, because it has a pretty close association with coastal environments, it can be subject to um, environmental degradation like uh, eutrophication where you have lots of pollution leading to high algal blooms and, and anoxic zones associated with those near rivers and um, uh, harbor outlets. Um, it's a generally shallower species compared to the gadiform fishes. Um, 
It's a bat spawner. It, uh, you'll see it's a much smaller species in general, um, but it it's an incredibly long lived. So place the European place is a very long. I, I was surprised to see how long it actually lives. Um, maximum age to be 50 years probably averages around 20 to 30 years if left alone. Um, they don't get very large, so there are going to be a lower trophic level fish. They only get around seven kilograms. But because they live so long um, and they're kind of a lower trophic level, they have a low resilience. So it can be over, over 14 years before a population can double uh, in the face of uh, either growth overfishing or recruitment overfishing. Uh, mostly from recruitment overfishing. If you take all the large individuals out, it will take a very long time for <laughs> recruitment in those fish. The, the subsequent juvenile fish to recruit into the into a uh, sexually mature cohort. Um, again, we have the same set of predator-prey interactions as well as stock population comments. Um, these are all links that take you to those various pages if you want to look at specific populations. Um, <laughs> Interesting, these fish are feeding directly on infaunal vertebrates and small fishes that burrow into the sediments. Um, they eat a lot of uh, bivalves as well as those marine worms. Uh, they're a favorite prey of lots of higher level predators, sharks and rays, dolphins and seals and sea lions, and cod in particular. Because they often use crypsis, to, they don't try to flee or swim away when put in the presence of a predator, they actually try to hide and bury, bury themselves in the sand. A lot of these predators like sharks and rays and dolphins um, can uh, sense them without visually cueing in on them. So sharks, of course, have ampullae lorenzini. They can feel electrical pulses of heartbeats and muscle contractions, as can rays. Dolphins can use sonar to detect them within the sediments. Uh, sea lions and seals have uh, tactile capacity of their whiskers to comb through and feel for them. Um, uh, cod have their barbels, so even though they use crypsis to avoid being seen, um, they are uh, they are a uh, very popular prey item for those predators that have other senses that allow them to investigate kind of the substratum pretty efficiently. Moving on to the common sole, um, this is um, a more southerly species. It likes you can see right here. It actually uh, is a, a bit more tropical or Temp, Subtemperate species in terms of, of warmer water temperatures. Uh, a sh uh, generally, uh, uh, I think it's shallower fish, I figure. But it has a very, you know, it's, it's another flat fish. It has a very similar set of habitats that it prefers mud and sandy bottoms where it can try to hide and burrow into the sand. Um, but in contrast to the place, it actually um, has a, a much faster uh, growth rate and reaches its uh, sexual maturity at a much small, at a smaller body length and, and actually quite quicker. So its resilience is actually a little bit uh, better, mostly because it's more of a tropical species. It grows a little bit faster. It has a faster doubling time. So its resilience is a little bit better than the place, um, but it still has a kind of that mid-level trophic level feeding on a lot of marine worms and <clears throat> small bivalves similar to the diet of the place. Um, here are some aspects of populations when they're most uh, accurately caught. Interestingly, these souls will go into uh, pelagic spawning migrations, so they are sometimes susceptible to demersal trawls that are off the bottom, um, and uh, commercial fisheries will sometimes target these spawning migrations if they know where they're going to be. Um, here are some general uh, time periods when peak spawning occurs in different regions, so um, two peaks in February in the Mediterranean, and in December to May for the Bay of Biscay, and then as you get um, to more towards the summer months, you see more populations spawning in the North Sea. Um, uh, actually, let me back up real quick. Um, an interesting aspect is place, at least in the northern latitudes of the North Sea, are commonly caught in these mixed um, North Sea commercial trawl fisheries, um, and sometimes fisheries that are targeting the sole, which uses a smaller mess size, will have increased rates of discards of the place because there's a minimum size landing of 27 millimeters total length, which is from the tip of the jaw to the end of the tail. Um, because they're using smaller mesh on the trawl, because the common sole is a smaller species fish, 
you end up catching more juveniles of this species and, and subsequently more discards um, in some of the northern um, latitudes, in, at least in the northern Red Sea, um, where they're using a smaller mesh trawl compared to central northern Red Sea, North Sea, where they're using a larger mesh, which allows these 27 millimeter sub-adults to um, escape through the mesh. So that's something to keep uh, pay attention to, the fact that there are various gears uh, can have within the same sea have impacts on um, uh, discards and, and uh, juvenile recruitment to the adult stages within a, within a mixed fishery of the north of the of the North Sea. Any questions on that? I thought that was an interesting tip that you guys might want to you guys might appreciate. Uh, okay, moving on. It's taking longer than I anticipated, but let's keep going. All right, so our la uh, second to last order, the Clupeiformes. These are herrings, shad, sprats, anchovies, pilchards, sardines, menhanes, alewives, all fall in this order Clupeiformes, which is a very ancient order of fishes. It's one of the more basal groups of what we call ray fin fishes. It's kind of at the, towards the base of the tree. Uh, five families, 84 genera, 364 species. Now, the interesting thing about the clupeiforms is they have what's called an otophysic swim bladder. So they have a small duct connection from their swim bladder, which is generally here in the body cavity, that connects to the inner ear. Clupeiforms have incredible hearing. They can hear from as little as 4 uh, millihertz up to 4,000 kilohertz, and they can detect these sounds, and they actually make a lot of sounds themselves. There was a recent article on fish farts, and it turns out these guys actually will expel gas like flats, and it's not the same type of thing, um, but they use it for communication, and they can hear these very high um, squeaks, as it were, um, to communicate between schools and with individuals within schools. And at sometimes they use that for predator defense by using it as an alarm signal, they think, at least so far. Another important characteristic of the clupeiform order is they have median scoots along the abdomen before and aft of the pelvic fin. So what you'll notice here in um, the clupeiforms, here's the pectoral fin, which is actually down and low on the body, but the pelvic fins, unlike in the cods, are moved posteriorly to be below the dorsal fin, and then here we have the anal fin here. So we have a rearrangement of the pelvic and pectoral fins, or not a rearrangement, but this was the primitive condition before gadiforms when this moved forward and ahead of the pectoral fin. They also don't really have any spines in their fins, um, but they have a set of scoots, and you can't really see well in this picture, but it's a sharp-edged set of dermal um, scales that are a primitive form of defense that, uh, well, is a suggested leftover bit of armor from their, more, um, their ancestors. So you'll see a kind of sharp edge usually running along the body, and in some species it'll run dorsally as well um, along the top. These are scoots. Um, they're generally laterally compressed, they're small in body size, um, and uh, their main feeding mode is planktivity. So they're feeding on phytoplankton and zooplankton predominantly. And these, of course, include your Atlantic herring, Clupea herangus, which is an important commercial fishery in the North Atlantic. <laughs> Um, these fish migrate seasonally between uh, spawning wintering grounds in coastal areas to offshore during the summer uh, following kind of migration patterns of older cohorts. So these guys have uh, what is known as kind of a learn response. Younger fish follow older fish to learn the migration routes and learn where the feeding grounds and where the spawning and wintering grounds are. A very interesting aspect of uh, this species and probably some of that communication used uh, with the squeaking uh, fish flatulence helps different cohorts or size cohorts in age and essentially age groupings keep track of each other in ocean depths. So they're very excellent hearing that way. Um, Midwater depths, uh, they can be found along the shoreline, uh, especially in, during spawning and wintering grounds. They are annual demersal spawners, uh, meaning they'll uh, broadcast spawn in water column. And what they do is they actually release a, a sticky ribbon of eggs that sinks to the bottom and attaches to the substrate. So they generally like to breed or spawn over rocky habitat, whether it's along the shoreline and gravelly areas or on um, offshore reef mounds um, 
uh, where the eggs will stick. And those eggs will um, develop uh, for as long as uh, three weeks, depending upon uh, temperature regimes and how you know often these things will spawn in such massive numbers that eggs will be buried by other other eggs, and so the ones on the bottom may not uh, develop at all because they're not getting enough um, circulation and aeration from uh, the water column. <laughs> they're very small fish. They have a decent resilience. Um, they grow relatively fast. They're moderately or fecund, but compared to some of the larger um, uh, gadiform fishes, uh, any one individual is not producing a high number of eggs compared to the larger species of fishes. Um, they can actually live to be quite old, um, but they're in that kind of mid-level, tropic level because they are a classic forage species. And this is the one we talked about in terms of um, being a facultative uh, zooplanktivorous filter feeder. Uh, depending on what prey size is available, they can switch between being a ram filter feeder to selectively sucking out large copepods or ichthyoplankton larvae out of the water column. Now, they're very sensitive to light, so they go through these classic diel vertical migrations. Um, during the day, they stay at the deeper depths, uh, shoaling together, which makes them uh, schooling together makes them susceptible to those kind of demersal midwater trawls. Uh, and then at night, they rise to these shallower depths following basically the zooplankton. As the zooplankton migrates to the epipelagic zone to feed on the phytoplankton, which has been growing all day in the sunlight, these Atlantic herring follow the zooplankton up to feed on them. Um, and they are a favorite prey item of virtually everything on the planet, from squid, sharks, rays, cod, and hake, Tuna, swordfish, whales, dolphins, you name it, everything likes to eat this guy. This is a classic forage fish species, especially in the North Atlantic. Um, and here are the kind of prey items it feeds on. Not only diatoms, so it not only feeds on autotrophic phytoplankton, it'll feed on a, a suite of zooplankton, including copepods and pteropods, which are predatory um, marine snails that are in the zooplankton, airworms, small jellyfishes, uh, krill, and it will eat fish larvae and eggs, but like I said before, don't get fooled by the, the planktonic arguments or the planktivore arguments of commercial fisheries. These are just one predator among hundreds of predators that are in the planktonic realm. There are five basic North Atlantic stocks. Um, you click through these, it'll take you to all those. Uh, and then our last order, the perciform or perches. This is the most advanced, diverse, and largest group of fishes on the planet. There's over 10,000 species, 160 families. Um, the most successful radiation of fishes um, out there. Um, the, the largest group of vertebrates on the planet, including all mammals um, and reptiles combined. Um, the Interesting aspects of these guys, they have spines in their first set of fins. They usually have one to two dorsal fins. These are actually two dorsal fins, but they're actually contiguous. The second dorsal fin is made up of a soft filamentous rays. It's a mobile fin that actually aids in um, acceleration and maneuvering. This first set of fins is spiny and bony. Um, similarly, we have spines in the anal fin. Um, first sets of spines in the anal fin, followed by some soft rays here that also helps in uh, locomotion and maneuvering. Uh, the pectoral fin is moved up on the body, so it's kind of more towards the midline of the body. Uh, and the pelvic fins fall just behind it, and it actually has a spine as well. Another uh, important aspect that has led to the success of this group is the fact that their jaws are very mobile, very mobile and gracile, and the upper jaw can protrude away from the, uh, the head very extensively, similar to what we see in the gadiforms. The gadiforms aren't as good uh, as persiforms. Persiforms have taken it to another level in terms of the dexterity and protractability of their jaws, making them very, very successful predators. Um, we have things like, these are sea basses, so here's like the Sarandae groupers and sea basses you would see in your markets in uh, the EU. Uh, Sparids are, I know, a very popular um, uh, bream, I guess you call them brooms over in the Mediterranean. Uh, that is also a uh, persiform fish in the perches. And the one that is an important commercial fishery is, of course, the Atlantic mackerel, Scomber scombrus. These are um, 
uh, fall in the family Scombardae. Of course, Scombardae is where we also find all the tunas. Um, and a uh, close offshoot of the Scombardae are the billfishes. And these are the most advanced group of fishes. So these are the latest evolution in terms of fish uh, locomotory performance. These are uh, pelagic fishes, uh, excellent locomotory efficiencies, streamlined bodies. They have scoots and a very deeply forked lunate tail. Um, they're built for constantly swimming, feeding, and moving. And um, their muscle tissue, of course, with the sashimi, is highly adapted for long cruising migrations. Um, they have all sorts of muscle adaptations associated with being able to swim at very high speeds over very long distances. Um, the Atlantic mackerel, though, is another bat spawner. Um, these guys are going to be, uh, you know, have a large depth range. Um, their preferred temperature range though, is a much narrower band in terms of uh, spawning and feeding. They, they have a much more narrow thermal tolerance for particular um, life history aspects like uh, in terms of spawning. They form large schools. Um, they stay near the surface, so they're not really a demersal fish. They're more of a topwater fish. They're found in the epipelagic zone. They're relatively fecund. They can produce about a half a million eggs. Um, they have a medium resilience, a medium level of resilience in terms of population doubling time. Um, they grow relatively fast. They reach sexual maturity uh, within about two to three years. Um, and they're a mid-level trophic level, but they're slightly higher than some of the other four species, mainly because they get larger. So they're slightly larger, one of your largest forage fish species in terms of body size, which means they can eat slightly larger prey items. Um, so they are a ram filter feeding fish. They'll open their jaws, swim through the water column, and basically suck everything that comes in their way. But beyond doing the classic zooplankton, prey types, copepods, arrowworms, jellyfishes. They will also feed on small pre-settlement nectonic fishes. So they'll go to that next phase where as fish are, are as ichthyoplankton are, are, metamor are growing and about to metamorphose into their adult size and become these small juvenile adult shapes. Um, that size is actually a good size for Atlantic mackerel to feed on. So they will feed on krill. They will feed on uh, other forage, small forage species, particularly in their juvenile stages, anchovies and sardines when they're in their small juvenile. These guys are going to be predators of the forage fishes after they come out of their metamorphic phase from the plankton. Um, and because they, they're, they're incredibly uh, nutrient-rich fish, a lot of uh, muscular tissue. They have highly adapted scales, so there's not a lot of um, bony parts to their skin. Their scales are very reduced to help in uh, hydrodynamic efficiency. They're a really popular prey item for uh, four beagle sharks and dogfish. Cod, hake, bluefin, tuna love these guys. Bluefish, swordfish, you name it. A very nutrient-rich source. Um, uh, yeah. Oops. Yeah. And so... Um, that's basically the eight species you gave me. I went a little bit longer than I anticipated, but it's about 12.30 now. Um, what I can do is, if you guys are interested, if you want to send me um, any... See you, Katie. Bye. Thanks for hanging out. Um, if you guys want to send me any particular question, any particular species, we can walk through the links in, um, in the, the presentation. Uh, otherwise, this this will be res a resource available to you to use uh, um, for your own edification and during the work. So hopefully, you'll enjoy it. <laughs> so, uh, any questions? Go ahead and shoot, and um, I can you know we can backtrack if you guys are more interested in some of the specific stocks, links, and stuff. I can do that as well. Is anybody still there? Well, I think what I'll do now is I'll actually stop the broadcast. That's probably a good idea. So I don't know if I stop the broadcast. I don't know.